In 1896, Utah became the 45th state. William McKinley was elected president of the United States. The first modern Olympic Games were held in Athens, Greece, and in Watauga County on January 27th in the North Carolina mountains, a son was born to William and Isabel Todd. They named him John Carl. When John Carl was quite young, tragedy struck when Isabel died and his father, unable to care for a young boy, sent him to be raised by Isabel's sister, Alice Hodge. Although Alice was single, she loved and cared for John Carl, just as her own son. John Carl worked every day alongside the employees of his Aunt Alice on her large plantation in Elk Creek, North Carolina, surrounded by the lush, fertile Appalachian mountain range. The heavily wooded mountains were becoming quite popular to the budding furniture industry in the nearby town of Lenore, North Carolina. From this small town would emerge such furniture manufacturing giants as Brawhill, Bernhardt, Kincaid, Fairfield, among others. The virgin timber that surrounded the Hodge Plantation was quickly becoming a valuable commodity. In his early years, John Carl witnessed his unspoiled, sleepy, peaceful surroundings literally turn into a thriving, highly populated area. With timber being the coveted prize of the furniture factories, a tiny general store would become a focal point of this transformation. In nearby Buffalo Cove, Mr. John Hamlet owned and operated the Buffalo Mercantile Company. The store became the gateway to the explosion of the timber business, which stretched from Buffalo Cove to Boone, North Carolina, through an area called Sampson, which previously could only be referred to as a wonderfully beautiful wilderness of God's handiwork. This area was home to the Cherokee Indians long before any white man knew it existed. During his childhood, John Carl, who was actually part Cherokee himself, could have never imagined what a role this store would play in his life in the years to come. Most of the citizens of Buffalo Cove's historic past have long since passed away. One exception is a former lumberjack named Luther Adams. Luther will be 90 years old this year. He recalls the booming timber business that was consuming the area. Well, when I was about, I was about 14, we, we walk up here four miles over at the Derby, pull us all uh, ten hours and walk back, walk eight miles and put across that saw. That'd be just not about twelve year old. And you get up at what time of the morning to start your day and how well, many get about, Dad'd get up four thirty build a car away. I'd get about six o'clock, five thirty, six. And you were the guy that started the boiler up, you were yeah. telling me. I'd go far up the boiler, or else it was a barn harness a horse and have them ready to go. So you didn't have any uh, equipment like they got today? You didn't have any chainsaws? You didn't have any backhoes? You just didn't used... have no chainsaws, no dozers, or no caterpillars, or nothing. Cut it all by hand, made it in the shovel and axe, cross cut saw. That's why he built that first road out of Buffalo. While the timber business was now in full swing in Buffalo Cove, 
Other events happening a world away would soon impact the life of John Carl Todd. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was assassinated. This would be the springboard for one of the bloodiest times in human history, the First World War, which resulted in over 40 million casualties. Just before answering the call of his country, John Carl met a lovely young girl in neighboring Stony Fork community and was immediately smitten. Born March 1st, 1906 to Joseph and Elizabeth Smith, Lula Pearl Smith was one of five daughters and seven sons. Everyone referred to her as Pearl. Shortly after meeting the girl that would become the love of his life, John Carl enlisted in the army and left the comfort of the only homeland he knew. At Camp Jackson, South Carolina, he became part of the 12th Battalion Depot Brigade. Following basic training, he headed to France, where he joined his fellow soldiers in rat-infested trenches filled with mud, dirt, and dead bodies. As a private in the Army Wildcat Field Artillery Division, John Carl specialized in mortar fire. It took seven to eight men to fire the mortars, and John Carl was in charge of lighting the fuse in the shell. Many men suffered shell shock, while tens of thousands lost one or more limbs. The stench of rotting carcasses and overflowing latrines was mixed with the creosol and chloride of lime used to stave off the ever-present threat of disease and infection. Add this to the smell of cordite, the lingering odor of poisonous gas, rotting sandbags, and stagnant mud. It is no wonder that many men were literally overcome. One can only imagine John Carl writing one of his many letters to Pearl amid this hell we know as war. He had only to close his eyes to see the beautiful image of her face longing for him to safely return to the paradise of his beloved Appalachian Mountains. Perhaps this longing helped John Carl survive those horrific days.